Welcome to those of you who are worshiping online. It's good to have you with us this morning as well. We're in the second message of a series called Cultivating Faithful Generosity, and I've titled today's message A Safeguard Against Greed. You know, as I've preached on this series, I said last week, I feel a... um, I feel like it's really important to communicate well when we talk about money because I feel like there's, there's so much skepticism that people have and, and there's been some bad teaching and all kinds of stuff gets kind of wrapped into that. But I'm really grateful that as I have a chance to preach on this topic here at McBick that I can do so with the understanding that you are a very generous people and that our church has been very generous. And I was really appreciative of the fact last week that as a number of people shared with me what God had been speaking to them, they talked about how they felt God drawing them to deeper surrender, in deeper surrender to Him, and growing them in their walk with Him. And that really is my heart in this series and what I believe God has for us. Have you ever wondered why Jesus talked about stewardship of wealth and possessions so much while we're often so uncomfortable with the topic? I'm convinced that many of us are less than enthusiastic about sermons related to money due to skepticism. We're skeptical about the motivations of pastors and churches asking us for our money. We're skeptical about how our money will be used, and frankly, we're skeptical of leaders in general. And I think our skepticism is well-founded. Pastors and churches do have a questionable track record when it comes to their motivation in asking for money. The churches often use the money they're given to care exclusively for their own needs rather than blessing others, and too frequently, leaders have broken our trust by failing to lead with integrity. I'm convinced that the widespread skepticism in our culture explains why many of us aren't excited generally to hear another sermon about giving. But my question for us, and the reason that I'm preaching on this subject is, Can we safely ignore or gloss over a topic that Jesus spent so much time on? And to help us explore why I think Jesus focused on wealth and possessions so much, I encourage you to turn with me to Mark chapter 10. I want to begin reading at verse 17. Um, In my Bible, it's titled, The Rich and the Kingdom of God. Uh, Sometimes we've, we've referred to this person who's in the story as the rich young man. I'll start reading at verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. The good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared. All these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed, and they said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. I find this to be one of the most difficult passages in the Bible for several reasons. First of all, we have an upstanding man who comes to Jesus and respectfully asks him an important question, but Jesus appears to treat him pretty dismissively and ultimately sends him away. 
Jesus' instructions to this man, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, seem extremely unreasonable. And when his disciples balked at Jesus' response, instead of qualifying it or softening it, Jesus said something even more difficult. He said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So what's going on here? Does Jesus have something against rich people? Does Jesus think everyone who's wealthy should give away all they have and give to the poor? What are we to do with this passage? Before we answer those questions, I'd like to back up a bit and take a closer look at what I think was going on with this man who who came to Jesus. First of all, we see the man came to Jesus asking, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Now, that's an important question for all of us to wrestle with. As we look at Jesus' response, it's important to understand that when Jesus interacted with people, think about Nicodemus, uh, the woman at the well, the man who brought his son with with an evil spirit to Jesus for deliverance. In all of those situations, Jesus' goal seemed to be to bring them to a fuller understanding of themselves so they could recognize their own shortcomings and their need of him. And to help them get to that place, Jesus usually asked probing, difficult questions. You remember with Nicodemus, he told him he needed to be born again, and and Nicodemus said, what, I have to enter again into my mother's womb and be born again? The woman at the well, he challenged her about worship, and she's like, I just came for a drink. The, The man who brought his son to Jesus, Jesus ended up talking with him about faith, and the guy said, I do believe, but help my unbelief. And in all these cases, Jesus asked probing questions to get beyond kind of the presenting issue, if you will. And that's exactly what I think he's doing here as well. In response to this man's question about what he needed to do to be assured of eternal life, um, my pages are turned around here. All right, just a little time out break here. There we there's the problem. I had an extra one that's a blank. Okay. In response to that question, when Jesus said, keep all the commandments, and he listed six of them, the man responded that he'd kept all of them since he was a boy. Now, I find it interesting that the commandments Jesus listed were six of them. If you read through, there's only six, not ten. And the six he mentioned pertain to how people interact with each other how we act with our parents, our neighbors, other people. He didn't list, Jesus didn't, the four commandments that focus on our love and devotion to God. I don't think that was an accident. Jesus saw that while this man was trying to do all of the right things, trying to treat people well, what was missing in his life was his ultimate love for and devotion to God and worship of him. After the man responded that he kept all of the commandments since he was a boy, we read these very telling words in verse 21, and we can't miss these words. We read, Jesus looked at him, and he loved him. He looked at him, and he loved him. It's impossible to understand Jesus' interaction with this man apart from seeing those words. If we miss that, then Jesus looks pretty harsh. I mean, a guy comes asking a great question, Jesus kind of puts him off, says, why do you call me good? No one's good but God. Then when the man says he's kept all the commandments, Jesus said, okay, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And the man leaves. Like, that doesn't seem like a loving exchange. But Jesus looked at him and he loved him. Everything Jesus did in interacting with this rich man was out of his heart of love for him and his desire for this guy to experience God's best. After looking at him with love, Jesus gave him the difficult instruction to sell everything he had, give it to the poor, and follow Jesus. Now the disciples who were watching all this were amazed and perplexed. It says twice in like three verses the disciples were amazed. They were amazed. Jesus said something else. They were more amazed. After all, this was the kind of guy that they could have used on their side. He was good, respectable. He had money. 
I want to focus on Jesus' response to this man before we look at what he said to the disciples. So what did Jesus notice in this man? Why did he give him such a seemingly difficult answer? I believe that Jesus looked at this man and he immediately saw that greed had a vice grip-like hold on his heart. The man was focused on works and appearance and doing good deeds. He called Jesus good teacher, to which Jesus said no one is good but God alone. The man followed the commandments that focused on how he treated others, but his love for God and his devotion to God was lacking. Jesus responded to this man, I'm convinced, with a radical instruction to sell everything he had and give to the poor because he knew the man needed to take radical action to break the hold that greed had over him. And Jesus continued this line of reasoning with his disciples. He told them it was easier for a camel to slip through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter God's kingdom. And when the disciples said, well, who then can be saved? Jesus said, it's impossible. No one can be except with God. Now, in our attempt to try to make sense of Jesus' words, we have this tendency sometimes to take really difficult sayings of Jesus and try to make them more manageable. And so I've heard it, uh, I've heard kind of the idea put forth that the entrance to the synagogue, there was one entrance that was really low that was called the eye of the needle because it was small, and if a camel was going to go through there, it had to get down on its, on all four, kind of crawl underneath. I, I guess that's true. I'm not really up on my temple uh, language. But if it could be, if it's possible for a camel to get through that door, it kind of undercuts Jesus' point, right? Jesus is saying it's impossible for the rich to enter God's kingdom. It's impossible for anyone to enter God's kingdom without God's help. I believe that when he said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, he literally meant take a needle and try to thread a camel through it. Not going to happen. He's showing us the impossibility of us being able to please God, being able to get to heaven without God's help. My challenge for us this morning isn't to give everything we have away. If you're thinking that, you can exhale. What I want us to see is this. God's challenge to his people in the Old Testament to tithe, giving 10% of everything back to him. His challenge in the New Testament for us to be generous givers. And his challenge for you and me to be faithful stewards of all he has blessed us with by cultivating generosity is a safeguard against greed. Why did God call his people in the Old Testament to give him 10%? So they would know that they weren't dependent on what they could generate, but that God would fill in the gaps and meet their needs. Why does God call for us in the New Testament times to be generous people? Because as he says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, and I believe we're going to look at that next week, he'll meet all of our needs. He'll take care of everything we have. He'll bless us abundantly. And why does God call us to be people who are faithful stewards because he understands that cultivating generosity is a safeguard against greed. Remember Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 6 that I shared last week. For where your treasure is, Jesus says, there your heart will be also. And then in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other, You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus looked at the rich man and he loved him. That's why he challenged him to give away all he had. And Jesus looks at us, at you and at me, and he loves us. He wants us to be generous because he knows generosity safeguards our heart against greed. That as we give to others, as we give sacrificially to our church, as we meet the needs of people around us, as we support various ministries that are doing great work, we're saying to God, I am trusting that you'll fill in the gaps. That when I make sacrifices or I decide I can live on this percentage of what I have, that you'll meet my need. 
We shared testimonies last week, and I'm committed to doing that each week. And Evan's going to come now and read some testimonies for us of people from McBick, they're anonymous, about how God's met them as they've chosen to embrace generosity. All right, someone said this. Before my wife and I were married, we decided to be faithful with our tithe. Throughout our seven-year marriage, our income has been blessed immensely beyond what we ever thought possible. And we continue to increase our giving as our income increases. However, recently, with the busyness of life and a work transition, I dropped the ball. I had been manually giving electronically and kept forgetting to do it. I brought it up to my wife, and we developed a plan to catch up, which was around $5,000. A few days later, we received a tax refund refund from two years prior for the amount to cover the catch-up. Someone else said this. When McBick had a capital gifts campaign for the construction of our youth center, we made the largest four-year commitment we had made, planning to take that out of the bonus we received from our business each fall. Business went well that first year, and we paid our commitment out of that bonus. However, the second year, our business really dropped, and we didn't receive a bonus. We thought we would have to take our pledge out of our college fund, but just about the time that the pledge was due, we received a gift in the exact amount of our pledge from someone who knew nothing about our situation and never before or after gave us that kind of gift. The next two years, we had no problem meeting our pledge. We really thanked God for his faithfulness. And a third person said this, Neither of us grew up in households where there was much talk about money. We knew that our parents gave to the church and to missionaries, but we didn't know how they determined how much to give or where to give it. When we were dating and early in our marriage, we listened regularly to Larry Burkett from Christian Financial Concepts. The lessons we learned together about stewardship of the resources that God entrusted to us have been critical in our understanding of giving, saving, spending, Learning these together has also allowed us to avoid some of the most common arguments that couples have about money. While we have not always agreed fully on how to allocate our income, we do agree on the underlying principles of living below our means, saving for the future, and giving generously to the church and other causes God lays on our hearts. We did not have substantial financial resources early on, but we learned to give generously from what we had. We learned and continue to learn to operate from an abundance mindset rather than a scarcity mindset. I remember a pastor telling us years ago that he and his wife had determined to increase their percentage of giving each time either of them received a raise. This was a good reminder that all of our resources belong to God and we can become increasingly generous as God is generous with us. Now that we are more established financially, we are in a place to think and pray about how best to give and invest in people and projects that God has drawn us to. We are finding great joy in the ability to give more than we ever imagined we could to see God's kingdom advanced. Thanks, Evan, and thanks to those of you who shared your stories. Uh, Several people talked to me last week after the message and told me some stories, and I said, hey, would you send that to me, please? And, and some of their stories centered around how their um, modeling of giving impacted their kids. That when they walked through a difficult time and their kids saw them giving generously to the church, even though things were tight, they were able to tell their kids why they did that and to really instill, instill that principle of, of generosity. And I think that's, I mentioned last week, I love the graphic that Cindy kind of arrived at because of that the hands of a larger person, probably a parent, handing that, that, uh, that tender plant off to a child. And I think that's really part of the process of cultivating generosity in a church family is making sure that the next generations learn about generosity. Each week during this series, I'm also committed to giving you a McBick ministry snapshot to demonstrate how the tithes and offerings our church family give help advance God's kingdom through our local church, in our community, and around the world. Every church uses the money that people give to pay their utilities, support the ministry and program of the church to children, teens, and adults, and to pay staff salaries. And those are all very important to keep a church running. But I'm especially excited about the ways the money our church family gives goes to support missionaries 
and ministries outside of our church. Our church's vision is disciples who bring restoration and wholeness to Mechanicsburg and to the world. And one of the main ways that we seek to bring restoration and wholeness locally and globally is through supporting missionaries and ministries outside our local church. Um, I want to share some, some numbers with you, just to, not to overwhelm you. Some of you, the numbers may be like, uh, okay, whatever. Um, but just to give you a quick snapshot of some of, w- of how we try to come alongside of and support other ministries and missionaries uh, financially. First of all, we're committed to giving 10% of our church family's giving to Brethren in Christ Common Ministries. BIC Common Ministries supports church planting, world missions, and strengthening local churches across our denomination. And this year, based on your giving, we'll give over $100,000 to Common Ministries. We support 14 local and global ministries who minister outside of our church and four missionary family units, missionaries who are members of our church. And this year we'll give just under 50000 to those 18 ministries and missionaries. The missionaries we support are McBick members who minister in Guatemala, in Thailand, and on campuses in Millersville University in Lancaster, and also at the University of North Carolina. And so those two, um, ind- an individual and then a family who minister in those campus settings, are having an opportunity to impact international students from, from all o- across the world. The ministries we support locally cover a wide range of focus from caring for the poor in our local community to orphan care, to ministry to those who've had abortions, to to natural disaster crises, and to refugee ministry. And again, I could list a lot more. Uh, For next year, we're proposing a budget that would increase our giving to outside ministries and missionaries by nearly $15,000. And I'm especially excited that we're significantly increasing our support of missionaries. My goal, and I believe our staff and church board are in, on board with this as well, is really to see that giving to outside ministries increase. And I believe that God, as we do that, continues to bless us in, in meeting our needs. I shared this with you last week, that at times when our board has made decisions to give money away to other ministries, we've been in a difficult place financially ourselves and had the tendency to say, well, let's wait and see if we're going to bless an outside ministry until we make sure things are taken care of here. But in those times, we've really felt checked, really felt led by God to say, no, we believe God's going to bless us. We're going to make that commitment to give the money elsewhere, believing that he'll take care of our needs. I have a pastor friend, who, and God has, has consistently done that. I have a pastor friend whose church was talking about... Um, doing an end-of-year project similar to what we do, but they were struggling financially. And he told me at breakfast one day that uh, they decided that they weren't going to do that outside giving project because of their own, um, the needs they were facing internally. And I really kind of grieved for that because I was like, man, I believe they're, they're not going to experience God's blessing, but I felt checked in saying that to him because I didn't want to impose my thinking on him. But I did have kind of that sadness well, I met with him recently, and he said, you know, we've, we've decided to, to do that. We're going to do that end-of-the-year giving project. And he told me that after he said things still weren't good financially. I said, tell me your thinking on that. And so he told me that they, kind of the same rationale that I just said to you, believing that God's going to take care of our needs. And I told him, I said, hey, I'm so happy that you're doing that, and I believe God's going to bless that. Here's the concern I had when you shared that. I felt checked in, in kind of challenging you, but but I'm excited to hear that, that you're going to trust God, and I believe God's going to use that to bless you. And I believe that principle not only applies to our church, I believe that principle applies in our lives as couples, as, as individuals. As God continues to bless McBick with his favor, our church board and staff are committed to continuing to increase our support of outside ministries and missionaries because we believe these are pursuing the same goal McBick has, of seeing God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, and we want to lean away from the tendency to focus only on what God is doing right in front of us. I confess, as lead pastor, I probably, not probably, I have a larger picture than most of our staff on what's happening in the life of our church. I know roofs that need to replace, paving that needs to be fixed, all those kind of things around the facility. And so it's challenging for me to think through, okay, how do we keep supporting other people while we take care of our needs here. 
And yet God continues to challenge me and to challenge our board and staff and saying, look, I'll take care of your needs. Continue to bless those outside of here and I'll meet your needs as a church. And he continues to do that. God's promise throughout the Bible is that as we give generously to him, he'll bless us and take care of us. And I believe that promise applies individually uh, and to our church family. Listen to these words from the book of Malachi, where the prophet Malachi is speaking words from God to God's people about their failure to give. And it's been noted that this is the only place in Scripture where God instructs his people to test him. In Malachi 3.10, we read these words. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I believe that principle is one that we see throughout Scripture. God says, when you give generously, when you don't try to hoard your money and believe that I'm going to meet your needs and you give to others, then I have the opportunity to bless you to meet your needs. Now, my hope for us, as we've heard this sermon today, is that the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart and reminding you of God's goodness and his love for you. That just as Jesus looked at the rich young man and were told he had love for him, he looked at him and he loved him, that God loves us. And his heart for us is not because he has needs. God's not sitting up in heaven and said, man, I hope those people at McBick give generously because I don't know how we're going to get this done if they don't. Like, he's not concerned about advancing his kingdom because of your giving. It's going to happen. He'll, he'll find people to do that. His concern is that we give generously so that we grow as his disciples, so that we position ourselves in a place where he can pour his blessing on us. Rather than viewing giving to church and ministry with skepticism, I hope you're able to embrace the important role generosity plays in your growth as a disciple. It was Jesus' heart of love, again, for the rich man in Mark 10 that led him to ask him to give away everything he had. And it's Jesus' heart of love for us and his desire to protect us from greed that leads him to desire our generosity. As we give generously and as we cultivate faithful generosity in our church family, McBick wins, God's kingdom wins, and you and I win as we grow as his disciples. Let's pray together. Worship team, feel free to come up. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your heart of love for each of us. That you know how important it is that our wealth and our possessions are committed to you. And that as we give to you generously and to give to causes that you're passionate about, that you will meet our needs, that you will care for us. God, just as you care for the, as you say in Matthew 6, for the birds of the field and the, and the birds in the air and the lilies of the field, God, you also care for us. Lord, speak to our hearts. Your desire for each of us is that we would be free from the clutches of greed, that we would be generous people, free from the concerns about uh, finances and, and where the next money goes, where the, where the money comes from. God, I pray that you would give us that freedom, that joy and hope and perspective in you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your challenge to us. I thank you that you look at us and you love us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.